So what we're going to talk about is Aristotle um, and the Organon, which is his work on works on logic. All right. Um, so here we have this the classical philosophy lineage, which we've uh, covered so far. We have Socrates, who we know through the Apology, the Meno, the Phaeno, Phaedo. We have Plato, who is his student, who wrote about uh, Plato, who wrote about Socrates. Um, you'll see here that Plato opens the Academy about 387 BC, which has a pretty fairly long history. It closes 529 AD by the Emperor Justinian um, for various reasons, which we won't get into. And now I will introduce Aristotle. 384 to 322 BC. So he is a Macedonian, which is a little different from um, both Socrates and Plato. So he's basically a foreigner, as the Sophists were, um, though he is certainly not a uh, Sophist. Um, he travels to Athens to be a student at Plato's Academy, which you see here. He's a student for almost for 20 years, which is quite a significant amount of time pretty much until the death of Plato, um, around that time or so. And, uh, sorry, after the death of Plato, he opens the Lyceum, which is his own school. Um, the story is that actually he had to leave Athens at the time because Alexander the Great, who was a Macedonian, um, who uh, Aristotle, in fact, instructed, was making incursions on Greece, and so Greece and Macedonia were at war. Um, Aristotle, being a Macedonian, had to therefore leave. Um, one of the things to know is that Aristotle was is probably um, one of the greatest students that came out of Plato's Academy, and uh, I would say that Aristotle is probably one of the great uh, philosophers, one of the greatest philosophers and scientists uh, as well. His uh, works on on physics and on logic, etc., and biology were very influential uh, throughout history. So he's one of the most significant, I think, intellectuals within the history, uh, within human history of the Western world. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to start looking at what's called the Organon, um, which were a number of works that Aristotle initially wrote and uh, they included his discovery of the laws of logic. Now, uh, logic is basically the art of reasoning. Up until Aristotle's time, um, it would, I would say that the Athenians were aware of logic, but they didn't quite understand the rules of logic. And what uh, Aristotle does is he uh, discovers and systematizes these rules um, and his Organon, which is the collection of these texts, would in fact be extremely influential upon the history of thought, of human thought, um, since Aristotle's time and all, all the way up until the Middle Ages. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, Aristotle wrote uh, prolifically on many different, different subjects, but uh, his, the Organon, these works, were initially translated by the later on by the Roman uh, senator or minister rather Boethius uh, Boethius who lived around the fifth century was um, eventually executed by Theodoric who was this Visigoth um, king because the Visigoths and the Vandals had taken Rome by the time but in any case Boethius was able to translate these works and he did not translate the other works of Aristotle so the whole of the Western world only had these works of Aristotle, and it would only be around the 12th century that all of Aristotle's works would be recovered. So, um, in many cases, um, because religion, because theology and philosophy among the uh, medieval Christian theologians was not well distinguished, uh, the Organon was really kind of the only um, collection of works that were kind of considered to belong to philosophy. Um, so the medieval scholars also did not have Plato's works. Those were lost as well, except for Plato's Timaeus um, and the translation of those works really wouldn't take place until about the 15th century of Plato's works during the Renaissance. So it's very interesting, the history of Plato and Aristotle's works and how they were lost and later recovered. So, but as I've said, the Organon 
did have a long life within Western philosophy uh, for the reason that Boethius translated it, these, these texts from Greek to Latin, before he was executed. Okay? So <clears throat> the Organon consists of the categories, which is the work on the nature of terms or words, you could say, and how words refer to things. Okay? On interpretation is then a work on the nature of judgments. So if I have a word such as Socrates, and I have another word such as human, I can form a judgment, Socrates is human. Okay, so the first work studies just the terms themselves. The second term work studies the judgments. And there's different types of judgments I can make for I can, because I can say it is not the case that Socrates is a dog. I can say that all human beings are mortal. I can say some human beings are married and I can say this human being. So there's different ways in which we can form judgments. Positive judgments, negative judgments, universal judgments, using all and every, etc. We're going to get into that as we move along, not in this lesson, but as we move along in the course, we will get into these different types of judgments and talk about them. And we will then get into the basics of argumentation. Uh, now, the laws of argumentation were discovered by Aristotle in the prior analytics, and this was really his great discovery aside from the posterior analytics, uh, because he discovers these syllogisms. For example, if I say all human beings are mortal, okay, that's a, that's a judgment, that's a proposition, and then I say, well, Socrates is a human being, the conclusion is that, well, Socrates being a human being, all human beings being mortal, Socrates must be mortal. So that's, a, that's what's called a syllogism. It's a collection of statements that leads to a conclusion. And what Aristotle discovered is that there are, are in fact, uh, many numerous kinds of syllogisms that we can form. Some of these syllogisms or arguments um, will lead to valid conclusions. In other words, conclusions that um, basically can be accepted and that you can say, well, the argument is okay. Or there's also invalid syllogisms, which if you know the form of these arguments, you would know that regardless of what the person's saying, because the form of the argument is invalid, not acceptable, the whole argument itself is bad. And so this is what he studies in this prior analytics. The next work is the posterior analy analytics, which is his discussion of the nature of scientific knowledge. In the Greek is episteme. And you'll want to think about that term because episteme is related to epistemology which we talked about in class as the study or theory of knowledge. So in this, it's kind of the first philosophy of science, and Aristotle develops a philosophy of scientific knowledge, which, it, when we look at it today, is kind of more of a, a uh, philosophy of how mathematics makes use of its deductions and starts from these axioms and the axiomatic method, right? So the actual scientific method that we have today using hypotheses, experimentations, and testing of things is not, in fact, developed by Aristotle there. That wouldn't be until at least the 15th century that this is rigorously developed. So the topics is on dialectic, um, which is basically the use of argumentation to discover truth. So what happens is you can basically offer a number of arguments um, and then I can say, well, wait a minute, you're, the statement that you're giving me, there's some assumptions behind that statement, right? So that being the case, I can discover those assumptions, and then we can kind of look at how the argument is structured and see if the assumptions that you made lead to a sound or a good argument or a true argument. So that's the topics. And finally, there's the sophistical refutations, which deals with fallacies or what amounts to pseudo forms of argumentation. So what we're going to be looking at in, in this lesson is the categories and on interpretation. Um, and just so you know, I'm going to be kind of going beyond the text. So you really want to follow my lessons and just make sure you do the readings just as a supplementary. Okay, and later on we'll be going through the posterior analytics uh, briefly. <clears throat> So let's look at an initial statement that Aristotle makes within the work on interpretation. He says, Now that which is vocally transmitted are signs, symbola in Greek, of passions in the soul, enti psychi pathimaton, and that which is written are signs of that which is vocally transmitted. 
Okay, so let's take a look. This is so, so what Aristotle is basically doing is making a statement about the nature of language and how language works, um, and how our words work, and how we refer to things. And what he's saying is that what is vocally transmitted, so the words that we use, are signs or symbols, like a stop sign, right? Symbols of passions in the soul. In other words, a passion would be an undergoing in the soul. Um, for example, an undergoing would be something like feeling the emotion of anger. An undergoing would be feeling pain. An undergoing would be thinking. So words, he's saying, refer to these passions, and really later on they become known as concepts. And um, parallelly, written words are related to the vocal words. Okay, so now the big thing here that you want to understand is that these words... The words that we use refer for Socrates to real. Uh, sorry, for Aristotle to reality. So if I say that Socrates is a man, um, the word Socrates refers to Socrates, and the word man refers to the fact that Socrates is a man. Okay, so this is important because it establishes what amounts to the realistic um, conception of language, um, which we'll talk about in a bit. Later on, this is going to be kind of replaced, well, not really replaced, opposed by other views of language, um, for example, some that are nominalistic and some that are um, idealistic, and we'll talk about that as we move along. So let's talk about how these impressions um, fall upon the, basically our soul. So first of all, Aristotle, like Plato, assumes that, well, the human being and all forms of life have a soul. This is this follows from the fact that anything having a principle of life is seen as as having soul. In particular, the soul itself is understood as the principle of life. Now, the question is, um, how do we learn things? How do we uh, obtain knowledge? And if we saw for Plato, knowledge was a form of recollection. Right? We die. We go into the afterlife, the soul sees all the truly intelligible things, the, the self-evident truths, the absolute truths, and then it's born again, it loses that knowledge and has to recollect it. For Aristotle, um, he has more of what amounts to a modern view of the nature of perception and knowledge. For Aristotle, at birth, okay, the soul and the body are a kind of compound, and there's really nothing in the soul. So... He doesn't really identify any kind of instinct. There's no ideas. Uh, instead, what happens is that there's what's, what's kind of like a tabula rasa, a blank slate. And a blank slate would be something that you could write on. And so when it comes to experience, he's going to use the metaphor that experience is akin to writing on this blank slate. Now compare that to Plato, because for Plato, well, when you're born, you have these ideas that are there and you just have to, and they're there before birth, okay, and so you just have to re recollect them. So for Aristotle, this is not the case. In other words, um, Aristotle rejects something like the, the innate knowledge or knowledge that we have before birth, okay, so and this is an important distinction. Uh, so what is, what happens then, how do we obtain this knowledge? So it's through sensory experience, and so for Aristotle, um, knowledge begins with sensation. So we, we have a passive reception of impressions, the phantasmata, they're called. In other words, I look out, I see a tree, I see green, I feel something that's cold. And these impressions, he says, are a compound of form and matter. In other words, there's the matter, which is the of the tree, and there's the fact that the tree also looks like a tree. Okay? And when I perceive, I, I perceive that form. I perceive a tree. Okay? And, of course, you don't actually, according to him, the perception is not the actual matter that you obtain, but you obtain the shape or the form. And that form, the tree itself, is sealed upon that slate akin to wax. And so it becomes like kind of imprint upon the soul, and then you can kind of remember it. And recollect it. Now that's different from Plato because, well, that's already there. So for Aristotle, those forms are obtained through experience. Those ideas and forms that we have are all obtained through experience. Now again, 
Words are mental signs that we use to refer to those things, those impressions. Okay, so notice the relationship here then is that we have an, an experience. We res passively receive the impression, the tree. It's sealed upon the soul. And then we, we, we create a word that refers to that impression. We call it tree, right? And so there's a relationship here between the word that I use, the impression in my soul, and the object that impressed that thing upon me. And that's why we have realism, because the things in relation to the things that I experience and talk about are real things. Because you could say, well, maybe the objects of my perception are not real. Maybe they're just I'm seeing a dream of some sort or some sort of illusion. Okay, so this is not the classical view. <clears throat> Now, <clears throat> what we're going to do is move into the categories, okay? So this initial discussion uh, is we're looking at on interpretation. We're going to move through the categories. And at the very beginning of the categories, which deals with the nature of words or terms, Aristotle is going to talk about the ways in which terms can refer, okay? Different terms. And he points out that there are first what he calls homonymous terms, and these homonymous terms are divided into two types. First, there are equivocal homonymous terms. In other words, terms that have the same name, but a distinct, completely distinct sense. So, for example, if I use the word fountain pen and you use the word pig pen, notice that I have the same name, pen, fountain pen, pig pen, but they obviously refer to something completely different. Now remember, words refer to the things of which the words are formed from. So the fountain pen refers to the, the writing instrument. The pig pen refers to the actual, to something that pigs live in. Okay, but both use the word pen, which makes it equivocal. Okay, for example, date as a fruit and date as a meeting. There's another example. <clears throat> a second example of homonymous terms are what's called analogical in other words, the terms are different, the words that we use are different, but and yet there's a similar sense in the way in which the different terms refer. So, for example, if I say healthy and I speak of my body as healthy, okay, well, I can speak of medicine as healthy, right? And I can speak of exercise as healthy. I could speak of food as healthy. I can speak of a book as healthy. Now, we have different terms here involved, okay, the bodies, medicines, etc. But the word healthy is applied to these different terms in a different sense, right? <clears throat> so healthy body is not the same as saying healthy medicine. It's similar, but it's not the same, okay? Uh, for example, animal instead of Socrates and a picture of Socrates. When I say that Socrates is an animal or is human, when I say that the picture of Socrates is an animal, is of an animal or a human, I mean it in similar ways, but not exactly the same, because a picture is not an animal, a picture is a picture, and Socrates is the animal, and yet the picture is of Socrates, so it refers to Socrates, who is an animal. Okay, so this is important, this notion here. Um, actually, this is incorrect. This should say same terms, but similar in sense, okay, because so, we have same terms, healthy, set of body, medicine, exercise, animal, set of Socrates, and a picture, etc. Okay, so this is important. We'll bring this up again. Um, it's not very easy at first to decipher these types of relations. Um, but we're going to talk about it later when we talk about the, the notion or the concept of being because this analogical relations will be very important in the way we talk about things. The second is synonymous relations in which we have the same term and the same sense. Okay, so uh, let me actually fix this because it's going to just confuse me as I'm moving along. Okay. So, same terms and same sense. Now look, same and similar here is a little different, okay? If I say that a human, that Peter is human and Mary are human, I mean this in the same way in sense, okay? Um, and if I say that a <coughs> red is a color and blue is a color, I also mean that in the same sense, okay? But if I say that my body is healthy and medicine is healthy, I mean it in a similar sense. In other words, a way that is both the same and different. And that's the difference between synonymous terms and analogical terms. Because the synonymous terms 
Basically, human is used synonymously of Peter and Mary or in color of red and blue, but healthy is not used synonymously of body and medicine. Again, we'll talk about this as we move along. <clears throat> okay, and then there's Peronymus, which Aristotle speaks of, um, which is really not something that we have in English so much as in Greek. For example, sharing common terminological roots, grammar versus grammatical. Okay, so we're not going to worry about that in this class. So what we're going to worry about is the univocal, equivocal, and analogical usages of terms. And in particular, the analogical usage will be important, and we'll clarify that as we move along. So let's get to the categories themselves. Now, the categories, which is Aristotle's text, is a discussion of the nature of basic terms that we use to refer to things, to beings. Um, just for a translation, a category, in the Greek it's kategoria, is a term of predication. For example, Socrates, this is a sentence, we have Socrates is the subject, is, is what's called the copula, the connecting verb, and human is the predicate. Now, term of predication means that the categories refer to the types of terms that we can predicate of subjects, because so because we can predicate human of Socrates. Okay, so what, what this means is that categories are going to be found to be the highest genre or classification of things. And again, we'll talk about what this means later on. Someone who studies biology will kind of have an idea of this a little more. Um, <clears throat> so just this shows just an example of classification systems. For example, if I have a living thing, well, I know it's something that's material substance, and then I know it's a substance, and we'll talk about that in a second. So what Aristotle discovers is that there are 10 fundamental ways in which we can refer to anything. So for example, the first is substance. So if I say Socrates is a human being, well, I'm saying the word human is being predicated of Socrates, the subject, basically in a way which describes what he is and his nature, right? I look outside and I see um, a particular, my dog, Euler, and I say Euler is a dog. Well, dog describes what he is. And, that's, and this is called substance. For example, if you're in a chemistry lab and somebody takes out, up, out some vial or whatever and there's something in it, and someone can say, what's that substance in there? And this is kind of what they mean. They mean, what's the formula? What's the structure that's in there? What's the chemical compound that's in there? And that's a substance. When I say that, that this person's human or this, per or this animal, this is a, is a, for example, an ape or a cat, I'm saying what the thing is, what its substance is. Um, the word substance here, usia, we'll talk about that later because it has some interesting notions. Um, the next is that of quantity, poisson. Um, for example, I can say that Socrates is five foot five. Now notice how that, that describes how tall he is. Or I could say that there are three persons in this room. That's a quantification of things, right? Notice how it's different from saying what the thing is. And in many ways, quantity will depend upon there being something because I can't have someone five foot nine or five, five foot five, unless it's someone. So it's Socrates that's five foot five, and he can't be five foot five unless it's Socrates or someone else. Okay, so what's the point? The point is that all of these other terms will be seen to be based on substance. You need a substance in order to have these other terms, and we'll see how that comes into play as we move along in the discussion of what's called metaphysics. Okay, the next is quality. For example, the quality of white. A table is white. Um, somebody has a certain grammatical knowledge, it's qualities, something sharp or bitter. Okay, and we have relation, double, half, taller, or you can have something that's next to me. For example, the car is next to the other car. Um, this building is next to the other car, that's a relation. We have location, in St. John's Hall, um, in the parking lot, we can say in Popwell Hall, right? So it's location, in the forum, in the agora, in the cafeteria, where's Socrates? He's in the form. Um, where's John? Well, he's in the parking lot, you see? So now notice this, is that if you're a substance, especially a physical substance, so you're a person, you're a dog, you're a tree, you have to have some quantity because you have to be certain length. You have to have some quality, 
right? Because the tree can be green or something. Um, you have to have some relation. The tree is in the yard next to something else and location in the yard. Time, the tree's there now. You see that? Yes, or it was there yesterday. It's going to be there tomorrow. Position, um, this applies for things that can move, especially, for example, Socrates is lying down or sitting. We have possession, having. So Socrates has shoes on, has a hat on, has the faculty of reasoning. Action, Socrates is cutting or burning. And passion, uh, Socrates is being cut and being burnt. Okay, so again, what I want you to notice is that first, these are the 10 different ways in which terms can be used to describe something. Now we can describe things, right, using more complex statements. But the point is, is in terms of simple predication, in other words, a subject term and a predicate, there's 10 fundamental ways in which this can take place. And Aristotle, okay, very ingeniously identifies them, and here's the list of the 10, and that's why they're categories, okay? Uh, this will be important when we start to talk about the nature of being, which leads us into metaphysics, or the study of being. So here's just a little um, picture of it. We have Socrates, and there's Socrates is a human being, so the subject and the predicate, and this, this shows you the realism there, because when I say Socrates is a human being, I'm referring to this thing that I call Socrates, and I'm calling this thing, this substance, human. Okay, so my words refer directly to it, and there's the realism there in my, in my language. Okay, um, again, I noted that substance, okay, is the basis upon which the other things follow. I need a tree in order for it to be a certain height and color, right? So the first types of categories then, this first one is called um, the basis category or substance. The rest are called accidents because they depend upon substance, okay? So substance is then the one, the, that which bears the other categories, which we can call properties. And because it can bear them or it can possess them, such properties are called the accidents of substance. See, and here we have substance, and the accidents would be quantity, quality, relation, etc. Examples of substances, Socrates, God, this tree, the number three. Example of accidents, white-haired, God is perfect, this tree is 15 feet tall, this number is odd. Um, now, substances have these qualities in which they are self-subsistent. In other words... Socrates exists through himself, but the fact that Socrates has white hair subsists or exists on the basis of Socrates. In other words, you can't have white haired unless you have something that is white haired, okay? So this type of relations, I'm going to bring this up a number of times through class, so if you're a little confused here, don't worry. The point of this lecture today is just to give you an introduction so you kind of get some familiarity with this. And the underlying subject of properties, in other words, the bear of properties, the um, Socrates, for example, as the substance or God as the substance is that which possesses the properties and the properties or accidents are the things that belong to or inhere in the subject, all right? So moving on, here's some examples. We can start to analyze these types of uh, categories. Quantity, for example, we can distinguish quantity into the continuous versus, versus the discrete, for example, a straight line versus a broken line. We can speak of the indefinite versus the infinite. For example, the indefinite is when I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Notice that you'll never actually get to infinity itself. Um, but there is the infinite, so these are just types of quantities. And substances have size, they can be counted, but quantity is distinct from substance. Okay. For example, this small bird and that small bird are two small birds. Two, small, and bird are distinct. So notice the distinction between quantity and substance. Okay. Then we have qualities, examples. There's alterable qualities. In other words, qualities that undergo transitions and have contrasts, such as black and white, smooth, hard, cold, hot, red, green, etc. And there's qualities that have shape and figure. For example, here's a quality, the shape of the person, outer limits. Okay, there's my dog. He wants to go out. He's going to have to wait. Powers, distinguishing capacities that allow a subject to carry out specific acts, such as thinking, willing, wanting, walking, jumping, running. These are just 
Uh, what I'm showing you here is different ways in which you can analyze qualities. Because it's not, not just that you have, well, red and blue smooth and, and smooth and hard. You have different, for anything that exists, you can identify qualities, quantitative properties, and etc. Habits, stable qualities that pertain to some perfection or skill, etc. Um, relations, we have real relations. For example, cause and effect is a real relation. We also have logical relations, which holds for thinking. For example, a statement, a proposition, is a real relation. For example, when I say that all human beings are mortal, notice the relation there is mortal and human, okay? or no human is mortal, which is contradiction. Okay, so these are types of relations. Um, some of the other categories, again, action and passion. Action involves activity of the agent, passion being acted on. For example, when I lift a ball, I'm acting upon the ball. Um, I'm the active agent. The ball is the passive agent. In a way, you could reverse it, too, and say gravity is pushing down, which makes me the passive agent and the ball the active agent. Okay? And again, here's the other, um, just a repetition of these categories.